Hey, good morning, gang. Everybody doing okay? You doing all right? In the house? Excited for what the Lord's going to do today? Hey, why don't you guys stand up with me, if you will? I've said this to you a number of times in opening up services over the years. Just want to offer it to you again this morning. I hope that you come with a sense of expectation today. Because when we set our expectations on the Lord, our eyes are set on the things that the Lord's going to do. Because there's never a time where the Lord's not moving. There's never a time where the Lord's not speaking. The Lord has something directly for you today. So I just invite you to come with a heart of expectation to receive what the Lord wants to pour out for you today. Okay? We good? Let's pray together and we'll open up and worship. Father, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in the house. Father, thank you for here before we got here that you are ever present, and that we can just come with a heart of expectation and know that we are going to encounter you today because it is the desire of your heart to encounter your children. So we love you, Lord. We give you this time. We offer ourselves to you today. Lord, have your way in this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's worship together. Nothing and no one comes. Nothing and no one comes anywhere close to you. The earth and oceans only reflect this truth. And in my darkest night, you shine as bright as day. Your love amazes me. Come on, church, sing it out. And I'll sing because you are good And I'll dance because you are good And I'll shout because you are good You're so good to me My heart will proclaim that you are good, you are good, and in the sun or rain, my life still, sing it out. Let's sing that again. Oh, and with a cry of praise, my heart will
another shout. Come on, keep lifting it up. We love you, Jesus. We love you. Praise you, Father. We praise your name.
Sing that chorus one more time. Whatever your circumstances, sing this over it. Declare this. Sing along. Whatever the circumstance. One more time. So beautiful. Oh, we sing all of all the earth. We shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise. We sing his name, Yahweh, Yahweh. We love to shout your name, oh Lord. He's awakened me, the hope in me, by calling forth my destiny. He's breathing life into my soul. I will thirst for him in his Like the rain, shallows on the barren plain. So my heart and tongue confess, Jesus Christ, the hope of man.
Father, that's an incredible declaration for us today. That no matter what we're facing, so often as a people, Lord, we want things to get better so we'll have hope. Or we want things to be fixed so that our faith can rise. We want to be proven to, Lord, that human nature in us. But the truth is, Lord, we just need to choose that our hope is in you regardless of what we face and what we see. So, Lord, as we have declared this in song this morning, that our hope has a name, and it's Jesus Christ. That he has completely been made available to us. And as we surrender by faith, Hope lives in us regardless of what we're walking through. So, Lord, I just pray this morning with this declaration to let hope arise in this room. Hope and encouragement would rise. All the circumstances that are represented, they face. Because they'll just change again at some point. God. That will not shake. Lord, again this morning, I hope arise. I mean, and you guys can have a seat. Um, this is a special day um, for us at uh, at Liberty. Um, one of the things, and really, you're going to hear for the rest of our time together today, that we're very serious about the next generation. And uh, for all of us, there is generations before us. From the youngest of us to the oldest of us, there are going to be generations that come after us. And at Liberty, we're very serious in what we do about pouring into the next generation. And so one of the things we're going to do today is we're going to take some time to recognize some specific groups of people today, celebrate them, and be able to pray over them. One of those groups are going to be, we are promoting up today, our fifth grade Kingdom Kid kids are now Rise Youth Group kids starting today. But they'll actually begin to step into youth ministry uh, this coming week. And so in just a second, we're going to have them come up so that we can launch them from children's ministry into student ministry, youth ministry here. We also are going to be celebrating our high school graduates um, today um, that are going to be graduating out of 12th grade this week. And... Um, Stepping into the things that are next for them. And also, if we have any college graduates with us today, um, that we want to recognize uh, those as well. Because big life transitions, and God has purpose and destiny, and we have a responsibility to cheer them on and to sow into them and to pour into them. So what we're going to do is if you are uh, a rising uh, sixth, if you're getting ready to be a rising sixth grader, if you are going into college, or if you're a college graduate, I'd like for you to come. And if we can get the fifth graders kind of over here, if we can get our high schoolers here in the middle, we'll get our college folks over here to my left. If y'all just come on, y'all give them a hand as they come. And uh, what we're going to do is um, uh, each of these uh, guys here, Lisa's going to share a few things about our, our fifth graders. Hey, Parker. Um, and, uh, and then uh, uh, McKenna and Jamie are going to um, uh, share a little bit about our high school grads, one of which is mine right here. And, uh, and then uh, Ms. Catherine and I are going to get a chance to share a little bit about our college grads here in just a second. And then all together we're going to pray over them here at the end in just a few minutes, okay? So I'm going to hand this over to uh, Miss Lisa. So fifth grade, the VFG has to go back to everybody. Fifth grade is a big transition year. When you go from elementary school to middle school, I don't know if you remember middle school. Big transition. And if you don't know who you are or whose you are, it will be difficult for you. And I know these guys well enough. They're going to be good. They know who they are. They know they have been bought by the blood of Jesus. And they are ready to sail forth and change the middle school. Although some of them are, are homeschooled, so they're changing their home. Right? Moms and dads? Yes, they are changing your home. So... 
The reason we celebrate fifth grade graduation is because it is a milestone. It's one of those things where you're not a kid anymore. You're a tween, which I don't really get that word. I, I know what it means, though. <laughs> this is my 40-year-old third grader. But you guys have such an awesome, awesome thing that's about to happen to you. The Lord has already begun to pour into you his heart and his hope for you so that when you get to wherever you're going, wherever he's guiding you, your feet will be firm, your love will be steadfast, and your heart will be on fire. And that is by choice. You have to choose those things. So I am going to miss you quite a bit. Um, um, I'm going to miss you. Although, what I say to my fifth graders, when you graduate out, you're now a volunteer. <laughs> so if I can't get you to volunteer, I know I have them to volunteer. Okay, that's a little bit of a hint if you didn't get that. Okay, so my prayer for you is that you hang on to what he's given you and never, ever, ever let it go. Because what you choose today impacts the rest of your life. So thank you for letting me be with you all these years. And next Sunday, when you're no longer in Kingdom Kids and you come back and you're now a volunteer, <laughs> let's just level up for me. So thank you. And I love you guys. And I'm excited um, to pass you on to Pastor Jamie and his team. And like I said in the first service, don't mess it up. <laughs> Sunday night, the 18th at Bonnet Street is your official First Rise Youth Group. Show up and let them know who's in charge. Okay. Well, I want you guys to know that I'll be there on Sunday, and I'm going to give all of you guys a hug, and I'm really excited about it. So thank you, Miss Lisa, for blessing us with these kids. Okay, so high schoolers and college graduates, I am, do you guys mind standing? <laughs> All right. <laughs> I, I promised myself I wouldn't cry, but <laughs> gosh, what the heck, you guys. <laughs> um, okay. So you are looking at some awesome, awesome, I don't even want to call them kids, they're like, anyways, okay, you guys, I literally just graduated high school like two years ago, so I was praying to God, I was like, what do I say to them, like, I don't, what, what do I say to you guys, because I've had such the honor of walking with you guys and serving with you guys, and honestly, each and every one of you have blessed me so much. And I just want you to know that each of you were designed with a purpose. And that as you're graduating, you're going to face some crazy things. Sudden, like people are going to start calling you adults. And you're going to have like bills and all these weird things that you have to deal with. <laughs> and a lot of things are going to start changing. And I want you guys to know the one thing that does not change is him. He is unchanging. So while everything around you seems like it's a whirlwind and you're meeting new people and you're in weird places, I just want you to know that you have a rock that you can stand on. And honestly, that's the only thing that has kept me standing because I feel like once I graduated, it was chaos. My life, I didn't know what I was doing. I still kind of don't know what I'm doing, but he 
is unchanging and he is steadfast. So stand on him. You guys hear me? And I'm so honored to have walked this thing out with you. And I thank you for letting me be a part of your journey. And I'm, you guys have blessed me more than you know. And so... I've, I've been on missions trips with these guys. We have, they have stood beside me in some of the most craziest times. With the youth kids, I know that I can look at Devin or Luke and say, hey, like, I need you guys right now. And this right here is a family. And I am so thankful for you guys. And I know some of you are staying and some of you are leaving. <laughs> Going far or just staying near me. Thank you. Thank you guys for serving, for being a part of this family. So I just want to pray for you guys. And if you guys would, oh, Leah, Leah's graduating college. How awesome is that? Leah has been a mentor in my life. I, I have been so blessed by her. She's the one who taught me how to be an intern and how to serve here. So I personally thank you for how hard you've worked. This girl has worked so hard to do all the things that she does and love those kids, but also get a college degree, two college degrees, right? Two college degrees. So I just personally, yeah. So one of the things I want you to see, uh, we, Lisa and I were just commenting, can you guys stand up right here? Our rising sixth graders here. And then do we have any rising ninth graders around the building as well? I know you guys um, are not graduating out of a ministry into another one like the fifth graders, but I want you to see these guys too. I want you to look from this step of the journey where she's stepping into ministry and next steps of your life that you're doing to these guys who are stepping into brand new situations, you guys who are leaving somewhat of the safety of middle school into high school, and you guys who, some of you are going off to all kinds of places. Most of you are, are, are graduating on Friday. Becca graduated last night, right? And uh, all these different transitions that as you are sitting out there looking at them, but in reality, more than you ever know, and you're going to hear it in the message today, they're looking to you. And so I just want to challenge you as McKenna gets ready to pray over this whole crew today, that they need your voice, they need your support, they might need your money, but, um, <laughs> but, uh, but, they, but they need you, and they need your leadership, that you get to pour into these generations as they rise up and lead. Amen? Okay, so if you guys would extend your hands, we're going to pray for them. Father God, we are just, um, we are so thankful, and as I look out um, at these kids and this generation, God, I just thank you so much for them, that you created them with a purpose, and that your will for their lives is more than we could ever imagine, and so we thank you that you call each and every one of them by name. And that you have things for them that we don't even know and we can't even understand because your ways are higher than our ways. And even though everything around us seems like it's changing and it's crazy, we know that we can look to you as our Father to lead us through. So God, I pray that you would just encourage every single one of these kids, no matter what age, and that you would remind them that during this time when everything seems like it's changing, you're a good father and that you're going to take care of them. You're going to provide for them. You're going to comfort them when they feel like they're lost, God, and you're going to be with them every step of the way. And I pray that you would not let them settle for anything less but your will for their life, God, and that you would give them boldness. You would make them courageous as they step out for you. And we thank you, Father, for all that you do and all that you've done for us, that you've created this family here. And we just send them out wherever they're going, God, as a family. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. So, welcome, 
this morning. Okay, so now, Kingdom Kids, you are allowed to go in the back. Bye. We'll miss you. Okay, so good morning and welcome home. How are you guys feeling this morning? That was sad. How are you guys feeling this morning? Yeah, that's better. Okay, so I have a couple things to tell you about. First off, if you're visiting, you can go back into guest services. There's some awesome people back there, and we have a gift for you, and we're glad that you're here. Um, another thing is, you guys have your bulletins? Let me see them. Wave them in the air. There are some pretty ladies who gave those to you this morning, and I'm not going to talk about everything on here, because if I were to, I could stand up here all morning and tell you about how there are a ton of awesome things going on. So you guys have this for details about things. You can come and ask me about stuff. You can ask Pastor Scott. I'd be delighted to tell you about all the awesome things that are going on. But the two things that I do want to tell you about are um, starting June 18th, we're going back to 1030. Yay! <laughs> you know what that means? It means we can make it to lunch and to the beach. Yeah. How awesome is that? Yay. Okay. So not next Sunday, but the Sunday after that. We're going back to 1030, okay? So don't be late. Sound good? Yeah. Okay. And then second announcement is June 25th, we're doing ocean baptisms. Yeah. How exciting is that? So I got baptized in the ocean uh, like two years ago, I think. And it was the best decision I ever made aside from accepting Jesus. So I really encourage you to come out because it's like the coolest thing when we're all gathered there together as a public declaration of saying, we are not ashamed to say that he is our Lord. We're there as a family, and that's so cool to me that I, I've got to go in the water with some of these girls sitting over there. Oh my gosh, I can't explain it to you guys. It's such a beautiful thing of saying, I am a new creation in Jesus. So I want you guys to come out as a family, and if you want to be baptized, hold back. I'm Don't let fear have a hold of you, because it's really, really awesome, I promise. I might be a little biased, but it's true, isn't it? There's joy there in the atmosphere. It's a family thing. So come out with us Sunday, June 25th. You can go into guest services or talk to anyone. Talk to me, talk to anyone to get signed up, okay? Don't be afraid. Sound good? Yes. All right, that's all I got for you guys. And here's Pastor Scott. Go, girl. Love it. Uh, as we were telling you, this is a, a family day and a day about generations. And at this time, if I could get um, the Jacobs, the Acres, and the Kriegs to come, if you guys are here and dedicate so y'all give them a, a hand as they come, if you would. Okay, the birches. Oh, y'all come on. Y'all jumping in. Come on. I love it. We love that. Hey, James. This is, um, this is absolutely one of our absolute favorite things around here. Um, as we said, for us, we kind of have, uh, this may sound like an impolite, impolite phrase, but we kind of have a cradle-to-grave perspective around here that uh, we believe it's about the whole journey and every step is important and that God's unfolding the kingdom all along the way. And so for us, from the beginning of life, where we can commit our children and our households to the Lord, to all the way when we're able to cheer people home when they cross the finish line into glory. There is an incredible process where the Lord is unfolding himself. We get to unfold the kingdom, um, and it's awesome. We get to do it together as family. Now, for us here uh, at Liberty, one of the things that we do, sometimes we get this asked, this, asked this question, we do baby dedications. We don't do baby baptisms here. Um, for us, we talk about baptism as a personal declaration of faith in the Lord. So what we do, and we feel like it's a broader um, importance somewhat, is where as we dedicate children, what we're doing is we're making a commitment today, and you're going to be asked to make a commitment as well as a church family, to, to we are together going to raise these children in the admonition of the Lord, that these guys are committing to home environments that will reveal the kingdom and teach Jesus and live out the gospel 
to, until the point at which these little guys can surrender their lives by their own choice to Jesus, where they make their commitment to the Lord. So that we make the commitment to them as we dedicate children, that we're going to live Jesus in front of them. Amen? So that's what we're going to do here this morning. So we're going to start over here with you guys. How are y'all? Hey, Ava. I'm excited. And look, y'all moved last week and you're already back. I love it. I was, I was picking on these guys last week because they just moved up the road a little bit. And here we are, we're back. But look, if you will, if you'll give everybody this. Can you hold her up for him? Look at that. I love the hair. Can you give everybody, or can you give them full names? Uh, Myla Margaret Akers. Awesome. And I'm going to ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, do you guys commit to, uh, to uh, live in such a way that reveals Jesus to her and to have a home that exemplifies Christ? Amen. All right, well, what we're going to do is we are going to anoint her with oil this morning, and we're going to pray. If I could get Rod, would you come? And any of the other elders, if y'all want to come, we're just going to pray. And we are just going to commit you to the Lord. Is that all right? Is that all right. Y'all extend a hand up here, and we're going to pray. Father, we just anoint her in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And Father, we just pray, even from a young age, that there would just be a love for the things of Jesus. And that this home will be blessed and full. And that I know as these guys have committed their lives to the Lord, that they are going to impart Jesus. And Lord, that, that every day as they make their choices, through difficult times and good times, that their face is going to be set towards you. And that their mind and their heart is going to meditate on the word. And they're going to live that out. Until the time that she chooses Jesus for herself, Lord, that you would guard her and keep her. That you would guide her steps, protecting her all the way. And that from a young age that she would love you and follow you all the days of her life. So we just dedicate her to you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. And we have, a, we have a gift for you guys. Oh, Michelle's got that. Michelle's got that. Wait, thanks. Oh, I love y'all. All right, we're going to. Hey, Jason. Oh, you know, it's awesome. Love that beautiful dress. Did you give everybody her full name, if you would? Eloise Rose Cree. Eloise Rose. How are you? Those fingers are good. <laughs> fingers are good. But listen, I'm just going to ask you guys the same couple of questions. You guys uh, have committed your lives to the Lord. And you guys have committed to have a home that unfolds the kingdom and reveals Jesus to her. And so she chooses Jesus for herself. And that's it. We love it. All right, if y'all extend your hand up this way, we're going to pray. Just pray a blessing. Would that be all right? What you think? Some pretty eyes. Well, we just anoint you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we just pray, Lord, that right now that you would just uh, wrap her up in your arms. Lord, that uh, all the days of her life would just be led by your spirit, Lord. That everywhere she goes, that she would just catch the glimpses of you where you're revealing yourself to her. And Lord, that their home would just be full of your spirit. And again, as they too face challenges in this life and have to make decisions, that their hearts and their minds would be set on your word. And that their faces would be set towards Jesus. And that as they make their decisions, it is going to reveal Jesus to her. And Father, that from a young age, she would just fall in love with you. That she would follow you all the days of her life. Lord, that you have a purpose and a destiny for her. And that she would embrace it and chase after it, Lord. Lord, that all of these little guys up here, that they're world changers. And we just claim that for her, today, Lord. And we bless her in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And thank you guys. Where are we? We missed it. We got everybody. We got Burgess. We just got lots of folks. I don't want to miss babies up here. We got all kinds of folks. Hey, man. How are you, buddy? Big blue eyes over here. You got you, you guys over here? Look, we got big blue eyes over here. You're looking good in those overalls, buddy. And they, Mr. Levi, you give everybody. You give your Wyatt Theodore Burge. Yeah. That's your dad, ain't it? <laughs> you see him look at you? <laughs> Well, listen, guys, have you guys committed your lives to the Lord? Know Jesus as your Savior? And are you committed to have a home that, is, uh, that unfolds the kingdom and reveals Jesus to him until he can choose Jesus as his own Savior? All right. You guys extend a hand up this way, and we're going to pray together. Good morning, everybody. Mr. Wyatt, what you think, buddy? We're going to pray. Mr. Wyatt, we just anoint you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buddy. And Father, we just pray that uh, 
you would just wrap him up in your arms, Lord, that he would even have an awareness of your presence right here and in an atmosphere of faith. Lord, that this little mighty man of God, that all, the, all of his days are written in your book, that you've ordered his steps. And Father, we pray that as this home uh, is filled with your spirit, as they make choices in good times and difficult times to pursue you, to walk in your word, that Wyatt's going to see that. And he's going to hunger for that for himself. Lord, that you would uh, just be revealing to your, yourself to him day by day and the people that he encounters and the moments and he sees in his mom and dad. And Father, that at a young age, he would embrace you as Savior, that he would follow you all the days of his life, that he would step into all the purpose and destiny that you have for him, that he too is a world changer. So Father, we thank you. And Lord, we just dedicate, we commit him to you this morning. We just love you and we thank you, Lord, and bless him in Jesus' name. Amen. He wants the mic. We got a preacher man up here. He's grabbing for it. He's grabbing for it. All right. Are we missing anybody? All right. Then this is what we're going to do here is if I can, for all of you this morning, offer to you an opportunity to commit to these families. Do you commit to live lives that reveal Christ to these families? Do you commit to live lives that follow Jesus as your Savior so that in moments of need that you can be there for them? Amen. Because we are born into a family, and it takes all of us together, that we don't want this new generation of children to be on their own, but we want them to be raised up with all of us modeling Christ for them, and that this really is how the kingdom unfold, uh, unfolds and revival breaks out. Amen? Amen. Thank you, guys. Y'all give them a hand. If I could get the uh, ushers to come um, this morning. As the ushers are coming, I just want to relate to you that uh, it's so funny how this day has unfolded. And as a lot of times people think that we uh, plan all of it, but a lot of times the plans just kind of fall together. And today was one of those where uh, everywhere we turned, it seemed like the Lord was bringing up something that was generational for us today. And I know you're going to be really blessed by the message that Pastor James is getting ready to share this morning. I believe it's on time. And it's an important word in this season. And the scripture the Lord dropped on my heart related to the offering this morning. Psalm 24, it says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. That means all the children that were up here a minute ago that we prayed for, the babies that we just dedicated to the Lord, they're not our children. They're the Lord's children. And we've been given stewardship of them. And that's a high thing. Because, you know, we have a tendency to sometimes when stuff is ours, we take control and possession of it. And we want to do with it what we want. But the truth is, we need to know the mind of the Lord. Because all of this stuff, not just the children, your finances, your resources, your time, your relationships, everything in your life, your next breath belongs to the Lord. And we want to have the mind of the Lord so that we can steward those things with His heart and mind, with His direction, and with His leading. Because when we do that, we can't miss. Amen? Amen. So as we pray over this offering today and we get ready to, to give today... Remember that, that the Lord knows your needs and that he provides for you because it's all his anyway. And that as we sow and as we, as we invest in the kingdom, we're investing in these little itty bitty ones that we just prayed for. We're investing in these fifth graders, eighth graders, 12th graders, college kids. We're investing in these generations so that the kingdom of God can unfold out here. Amen. Father, we just thank you for this time. Thank you for this offering today that as we give, that we would give with that in mind, that we're not giving of our stuff. We're just investing your stuff in what you're doing. It's just stewardship, Lord. And thank you for entrusting us with that, that as we are led by your spirit, as we're surrendered to Christ, that we get to have our hands on these things that unfold revival, that the world changes, that people are healed and set free, and people find hope and destiny and purpose. Thank you for that, God. So multiply this offering today for your kingdom work and bless the folks that give. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church. How's everybody doing? All righty. We're so excited to be here today. I feel so honored and privileged to be able to bring the Word of God to you. Uh, the title of my message this morning is Helping the Next Generation Win. And I really believe this is a message from the Lord. Um, been working, had the privilege of being able to work for 19 years now with the youth. 
And I just know that the center of God's heart is for the next generation. But before I get there, I got a little bit of family business to do with you guys because I don't feel like I've been able to celebrate with you uh, because we waited for a while. And most of you know, um, but we are having another baby. And you would think that after, uh, you know, three girls in a row, that the Lord's going to give me another boy. Um, but we are having another girl. And so what I need to hear from you is, it going to be okay? Am I blessed? They're going to take care of me, right? Is that what you're saying? All right. Well, why don't you pray for my 13-year-old boy that has a house full of ladies? Because he's starting to think that God's mad at him. And he's been praying, Dave. He's, sure that he's not sure that prayer works anymore. Uh, so be praying for us. We are, uh, we're excited. We're excited. <laughs> oh, and, and uh, you know, when they become teenagers, I'm putting them up for adoption. I'm just kidding. Um, helping the next, let's not get started with this yet, okay? Helping the next generation win. So I'm going to talk this morning about helping the next generation win. And if we're going to talk about the generations, then what we have to do is look at the different generations. Because my experience is, a lot of times it's easy to be critical of that which you do not understand. And I see a lot of people today very frustrated uh, with the di different generations because they're so different than us. So we're going to walk through the different de generations, and I believe as we walk through... Um, maybe the Lord's going to speak to you, but overall that you would hear that he is for, and as Matt Meekins called, his generation. And so um, I'm just believing that God's going to be encouraging and speaking to us. So let's just start at the beginning, okay? Well, this isn't the beginning, okay? That would be uh, Genesis. Um, the first generation I want to talk about is the greatest generation, okay? Do we have any greatest generation people here? All right, a couple. Can we give them a hand? All right, all right, so this is, uh, let, let me tell you a little bit, I did a lot of study on this, and I think it's helpful, 1929, I know it says 1930, 1929 to 1946, Tom Brokaw, he's the one who called this generation the greatest generation, he wrote a book, they were a generation that went to war, not because they had to, they went to war because they wanted to, this was a generation with a crazy, amazing work ethic, they were hardworking. They persevered. They grew up in hard times, World War II, the Great Depression. All the history books will tell you about this amazing generation that they grew up with character. They took responsibility. And they also had a strong sense of gratitude. Am I right on that? All right, the people who raised their hand like, amen, brother. It's the best preacher I've ever seen. <laughs> Preach on, brother. Um, the life paradigm for this generation, that you have a job. Some people need to hear that today. But that generation, they, they were just thankful to have jobs. Um, so, as I studied about this, one of the most influential generations, they sacrificed and paved the way for a lot of us today to have the freedom and affluence that we have in America from hard work, perseverance, character, integrity, loyalty to your country. Amazing generation. Okay, next generation moving on. You tell me what this generation is. Yep. Yeah, this is called the Smith generation. <laughs> I just keep having babies. Hey, look, I'm growing the church, Dave. All right. So this is the baby boomers, right? 1946, and I got it wrong. It's to 1964. Not 54, 64. So there's probably a few of you in here that's a baby boomer. Okay, 1946 to 1964. Uh, the boomers came nine months after World War II, the maternity ward started filling up, all right? Because the soldiers back home, they missed their ladies. And you know what happened. 76 million babies were born during this time. Baby boomers. Because it was such a large generation, they were large and in charge, uh, there was a little bit of a sense of entitlement. I had a few conversations here about this, but there was a little bit of a sense of entitlement with them because they, they were hardworking, yes, but they also were like, I want a better life than my mom and dad have. I don't necessarily want the life that my mom and dad have. 
So they were boomers. So if you're getting frustrated, the new generation of millennials understand there was a dose of it all the way back then. Y'all still with me? Okay, next generation. This might be, for some people, this is Generation X. Okay, this is my generation, 1965 to 1982. Grew up, again, this pendulum swings on each generation. They grew up where the world was broken again. They had Vietnam. They had Watergate, the energy crisis. Roe versus Wade was a big deal. Um, and so they grew up in a harder, darker time. And uh, the, the catchphrase back then for the kids was latchkey kids, meaning the economy was so tough that mom and dad had to go to work. So the kids had to raise themselves. And because of that, there was a lot of brokenness. So I gave them the life paradigm, relate to me. They wanted authentic relationships. Okay, now we have our easiest group to pick on, and we're going to do some picking on today. Who is this group? The Millennials. You can cheer. All right, yep, yep, yep. We're getting ready to work, you guys. Just hold on a minute. Okay, 1983 to 2000, this is the digital generation, okay? They're the largest population, you guys are the largest population in Earth's history. A half of the world's population is under 25. Three billion Millennials. We need to pray. Y'all met millennials. Y'all need to pray. It's, it's, and, and, and I say this in love, it's a me generation. Um, it's a me generation. Generation of the selfie, 93 million selfies are taking per day in the United States. It's out of control, but they're passionate, they're creative, and they're driven. Um, I would characterize them, the history books would characterize them as there's couple things speed convenience entertainment and entitlement those are the Millennials so I have a video I have to show you because it is so funny and it totally and so don't get offended Millennials okay I'm throwing it out disclaimer guys I've been my life to you guys but y'all are funny and messed up <laughs> we're gonna watch this video you're gonna laugh I was at church one day, and the speaker that day was, um, was different. I just sat there with tears in my eyes, learning about this ministry that was revolutionizing the planet. I'm talking, of course, about Millennial International. The need is enormous. There are over 10 million Millennials out there who have graduated with no work ethic, no job, no discernible skills at all, and they have expenses. Housing. Student loans. Credit card debt. And I didn't really realize the magnitude of the problem until I looked into the eyes of a millennial, and I saw that face with the, the dead, nothing's happening up here kind of thing. So I went out to the booth after the service, and I talked with the guy, and he really informed me about the devastation that's not being able to fund a millennial lifestyle. Core power yoga. Birch box for men. I looked over all the envelopes, and my heart was really touched when I saw this one particular fellow that I, I just had to get more information about him. He was uh, Declan from Beverly Hills. I am an uh, aspiring photographer. I graduated college with an art degree, so obviously that puts me at a disadvantage. Volkswagen Jetta lease. Beard wax. Spotify premium. In his last letter, he wrote to me and said that his uh, weekend was, oh, how did he put it? Um, totes lit fam. Literally have no idea what that means. Spin cycle membership. Pet food for my rescue dog. Uber's home from a pub crawl. A typical sponsorship program costs $29 a month. Millennial International is actually $2,900 a month. Yeah, it seems expensive at first, but when you see the need, <laughs> it is so worth it. Trunk Club subscription. Essential oils. Annual pilgrimage to Bethel Church. It's the same as a traditional sponsorship program, uh, except instead of getting, say, a soccer ball for his birthday, he's getting an Audi. Am I capable of having a job? Sure, but I just feel like Maybe employment right now would just kind of be stifling my creativity. Through the sponsorship program, they actually set up a chance for us to meet each other in person. I brought him an apple pie that my wife had baked for him, but I totally forgot he's gluten-free. 
we couldn't eat it. I mean, obviously I've seen Food Inc., so I don't eat the traditional meals like everybody else. For breakfast, I usually do like some kombucha juice. He really didn't have much energy that week, and it turns out you know, he was on a juice cleanse. And I wanted to respect that. My wish for Declan, oh gosh, uh, that he would realize his potential in life, that he would be better, achieve more. I've been getting blue ribbons and participation trophies my whole life. What do you expect? For me, if it wasn't for the program, I'd have to get a job. Or worse, start a GoFundMe. Many of these kids in traditional sponsorship programs are fighting diseases like malaria, pneumonia, tuberculosis. And these millennials have the same struggle. Peanut allergies, pollen sensitivity, lactose intolerance. Kids in Africa are getting typhoid. Declan was recently diagnosed with tennis elbow. <laughs> I was originally paying vision and eye care insurance for him, but it turns out his eyeglasses weren't even real. To me, you can't put a price on friendship. Join me in sponsoring a millennial today and help us. Help us. Help us. Help us live the lives we portray on Instagram. Oh, Nelly, that is good. Oh, geez. It's funny because it's kind of true, isn't it? It's almost a little too true. I'm, I'm done. I'm, I've got to pray and leave. They're going to hurt me. Um, I just, when I saw that, I just loved it. So the reality is, is um, we can joke about it, but the, but, but the truth is, we need someone that are committed to that generation. And, 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 and the more frustrated we get with them or the things that we don't understand, uh, the more critical we get, um, we have to realize that this is his generation that he wants to rise up for his purposes. Amen? So there's another generation. I don't want to leave them out. Uh, it's Generation Z. There's no picture. How about technology? Um, generation Z from 2000 to 2018 this is a, the digital generation on steroids. They're addicted to technology. Where the millennials grow up in front of a screen, uh, two different screens, uh, the Gen Z kids have five different screens in front of them. And uh, what I call them is screenagers, okay? And I have one. I'm serious. You think I'm kidding me. Uh, the Kaiser Foundation did a, a report, and in America, kids between the ages of 8 and 18 are spending 7.5 hours a day in front of a screen. That's messed up. Listen to this statistic. Um, you know the time, they did a study, the time collectively that the world spends on Facebook in one day. All the world spends on Facebook in one day. They collected it all. If you bunch it all together, listen to how much, it, how much time we're spending. 39,757 years a day on Facebook. It's shocking. But it's also true about this generation, the, the newest generation, is that um, they're, in, they're, they're growing up in America in some of the darkest times. There are 26,000 terrorist attacks uh, over in, in the world in the last 18 years. There's an economic recession, there's racial unrest, there's political pressure. It's a scary time, an uncertain time. And to make it even worse, they're coming home and they have dubbed them the fatherless generation. So they're coming home, and there's no dad in the home. So they have to deal with these pressures and all these things. And in some way, you look at the millennials, you look at Gen Z, and, and you almost want to say, well, what do you expect? And so I feel like the Lord has given me a real heart to look at these generations. And I think as the church, we got to understand that we have a responsibility to them. Am I preaching to anybody? Yeah. And that's the point of the message. Now, here's the deal. It's easy to pick on the younger generation because they're hard to understand and they can be frustrating. But I, I need you to hear this. Many adults see youth as the problem, but I believe God wants us to see them as the solution. Many adults see them as the problem, but I believe God wants us to see them as the solution. So I want you to think as I, I'm preaching to you, um, I think we need a biblical change in our perspective about the younger generations. Scripture is abundantly clear that we have a responsibility to see them win. That it's our responsibility 
not to get frustrated with them, not, not to want to lecture them or control, but we have a responsibility to figure out how we can help them to win. Because when they win church, we win. And so this is kind of what I'm going to be talking about, uh, staying committed to them. Now, you might ask the question, so who's my next generation? Am I just talking about the little kids and the youth? I'm not. In fact, for purposes of the study, who's the next generation? I would submit to you the next generation is anyone who is coming behind you. How many of y'all love Brother Alva in this house? Isn't he awesome? Now, that is a boy. I'm going to call him a boy. <laughs> um, that is a man who, who gets what I'm saying. Everywhere he goes, and it's not just youth kids, I got pictures of him in the back with, with young men and, and with older men, and he is imparting to them the truth about God. That his whole life, you cannot hang out with him for more than two minutes when he is not grabbing some generation by the shirt, looking him in the eyes and saying, listen to me as I talk to you about Jesus. And he inspires me. And I just believe that he gets it. He has a biblical view for the next generation. So um, scripturally, I really believe this is not a man thing. It's not a clever sermon. I believe it's God's design that you are willing to invest and equip the next generation to win. That it was just like marriage is not man's idea. It's God's idea. This idea of investing, passing the torch to the next generation, that's God's thing. He, in scriptures from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, you'll see that is his way of raising and mentoring that next generation is for us to have a heart for them. So when we miss a heart for them, I really believe we're missing Jesus. You still with me? Yes. Okay, okay. All right. Um, so the scripture, I just love the scripture. Memorize it. Put it on your refrigerator. Psalm 145.4. One generation shall shout your praises to another. Can we say this as a group on three? Ready? One, two, three. One. <laughs> That's your fault, not mine. I'm kidding. Hey, that just shows you that I'm <laughs> blaming you. All right. Ready? On three. One, two, three. One generation shall shout your praises to another. That's your call. One generation. What's in the middle of God's heart? One generation shouting God's praises, shouting his goodness, shout, shouting that he has a plan to the next generation. What did we see up here this morning? We were shouting to them the praises of God. So, um, so I, th that's where we're going. Um, not the problem, the solution. Not the problem, the solution. Um, and I can, I can, I know, I know, I know, I know. It's challenging. I've been working with teenagers for over 18 years. Pray for me. Do you pray for me? Okay. I love them, but they tell me on a regular basis how old I'm getting. Okay? And to be honest with you, technology is starting to get scary for me. Am I alone in that? It's going so fast. It's getting scary. Um, hello, autocorrect. You ever had a moment with autocorrect? You got to be careful with technology. It can burn you. I'm going to tell you the story, and I shouldn't tell you the story, but I will tell you the story. Um, so I'm speaking at, speaking, I can't even keep up with text. So I'm speaking at Wanchi's Christian Academy, and, uh, and I'm just on, you know, on fire. I'm speaking about arrows, you know, and, and, and their theme was arrows, and I'm just feeling the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you know, and, and, and people are, are really receiving, and I'm getting so jacked up, and I get back to my seat, and I feel like the Lord dropped in my heart the name of my next baby girl. And so I'm super stoked, and I'm just, because I've never got a chance to name one of my kids, all right? We're still, we're in therapy, but we're getting it. Um, so I'm finally like, I believe it's God. And so I, I get out my phone and I text Kimber. And I say, Kimber, uh, I, I didn't say Kimber. I said, I, this was my text. I said, I, 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 I think that I got a name for our baby girl. And, um, and, and I hit send, okay? And then I started talking and, and going off. And then all of a sudden, I didn't get a text back from Kimber. And I'm getting really upset about this. I'm like, I'm excited about this. I think I got the name of our girl. I just sent you a text. I, I think I got the name for our baby girl. And then all of a sudden, I look down at my phone. And I'm waiting for the text. And I realize I didn't send the text message to Kimber. <laughs> I sent the text message to a high school boy. 
immediately like, I'm going to jail. <laughs> There's a high school boy that just got his text messages from his youth pastor, and it says, I think I just got the name of our baby girl. <laughs> and if it was a girl, I'd be in jail right now. <laughs> so I'm sweating. I have a panic attack. I have a heart attack. And I, I just, I, 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 I mean, seriously, I didn't know what to do. And, I, and thank God it was one of our high school kids named Devin. He's sitting here right now. And, and so Devin being Devin, he goes, awesome, what's the name? <laughs> That's what he said. But I promise you there's parents out there that if they read that text, whoo, we're going to have an elders meeting. <laughs> and it ain't going good for Mr. Jamie. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? So, uh, so that did happen to me. Has that ever happened to you before? Am I the only one that had an autocorrect or text mistake? Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of those. I lived through it. And the language, uh, I, just, I, I, I don't understand it. You know, totes and on fleek and bay, YOLO, throwing shade, and uh, all these, I'm like, uh, the newest one, this Christian slang, uh, I saw the coffee cup, wake, pray, and slay. I'm like, what does slay mean? Like, is that you talking about Braveheart? Like, what, what's going on here? I, I, I don't understand. It's not just you. I don't understand them. In fact, the newest one is lit. You ever heard that? Lit? Okay, lit. All right, let's be honest with each other. In my generation, Dave, let me tell you what lit meant. Okay? In my generation, if you call me, there was one meaning for lit, and it had everything to do with drugs. So I had a, I just learned about this word, I had a middle school kid and he grabbed me, he runs me out to his parents' car, his mom, and she goes, he goes, dude, this is Pastor Jamie, he's so lit, <laughs> and my eyes started to cross, and I'm looking at her and her eyes are crossing, and I said, I don't do drugs, <laughs> and I want you to know, this is a safe place for your kids, we don't do drugs, I am not lit, I have not been lit since I got saved about 20 years ago. All right? Lit. It's a generational thing. Okay? I cannot think about it outside the drug. That's what it was for us. When we were lit, we were lit. Uh, you guys are like, uh, can you uh, please stop the sermon, please? But I got saved and I didn't get lit anymore. Okay? <laughs> all right. All right. All right. All right. Hold on. Let me have a drink. <laughs> all right. I don't, um, okay, oh, oh, high school kids, what does lit mean? Okay, lit means now that you're awesome, it means that you're cool, it means yeah, all right, that's what lit means. All right, all right, all right, I know I'm 40, it's getting, to, it's get, I'm getting old, just so stay with me. I know dabbing was last year, but I'm going to keep doing it because I'm, for, I'm 40. Can y'all settle down? All right. I don't, I, shh, shh. I don't understand them, but what I do understand, church, is that they are going to usher the greatest revival the world has ever seen. And here's the deal. They are. Moses said it. You, you, it's that next generation. You know that the Lord is clear. You, you, you guys are smart. You guys are biblical. You know that if you look at the world and the evil and the wars and all the things that are going on right now, you know the Lord's coming back soon. You know he is. And so that's his generation. That's the generation, the army, the dry bones that the prophet says, I'm going to raise up in those days, and they're going to come to life, and they're going to look like an army. And so if God's committed to them, guess what? I want to be committed to them. And if, and, if, and if God's committed to them, then you have to be committed to them. And it's not just high school kids. It might be a, a, a group of men who are, are having issues with their marriage. It might be a, a group of older men. It might be a, a women's group. There's all, any generation that comes behind you, that's your responsibility to pass the torch. Turn to Psalm 78. This is where I got my message from. I really want you to read this because um, at Liberty here, we are committed that every sermon that we get or idea that we get, it is rooted in the scripture. It starts there, 
It starts there. Because the stories that I tell you, even though they illustrate points, and Jesus told stories, so don't throw stones, uh, they are always to get you back to the Word of God because that's the thing that never returns void. So if you get anything out of my message, you've got to get Psalm 78 out of the message because that's where it came. All right? So Psalm 78, let me read it to you. Um, this is the biblical call to the next generation in God's Word, authority greater than I. Oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things, things from the old. What we have heard and known, what our Father told us, we will not hide their children. We will tell the next generation. The praiseworthy deeds of the Lord, his power and the wonders he has done. He decreed statues for Jacob and established the law in Israel, which he commanded our forefathers to teach their children. Verse 6, so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children, then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. Amen? So what is he saying here? We will not hide them from the next generation. We will tell them. This is written by a man named Asaph. Asaph was a Levite one during King David's uh, time, one of his chief musicians. He wrote 12 psalms. This is the longest historical psalm that we have. And there's a prophetic word inside it for us today. Verse 3. I will utter hidden things from the old, what you heard and known, what our fathers have told us. You know God's original intention, church? His original intention is for fathers and mothers to be telling their kids about the wonders and praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. That's God's original heart. That's the way he set it up. That's his design. That's the primary responsibility of the father and the mother. And I know I'm not the only one that's sitting out there today that has a testimony that that is not my story. I did not have a dad that said, hey, buddy, get up, get your clothes on. I'm going to take you to church. I want to take you out to nature, and I want to tell you who created all this. Get up. Let me tell you about how to trust in the Lord. I didn't have that. And you know what, church, the more and more I study, let me just tell you something about this, uh, this generation. These, are, these kids are growing up in fatherless homes. This is an absolute epidemic. They're calling it the fatherless generation. Asaph says, look, what your fathers have told you. Well, well Asaph, the fathers aren't telling our kids much of anything these days. And now, this is not a blanket statement. There are amazing fathers out there. I'm looking at them, some of them right now. But overall, I've been, I work with the kids. I work back there. I have 100 kids come into youth group. And I would tell you, really without a shadow of a doubt, that 70% of them are coming from broken families. And you know what they want, church? They want a family. They want, they, they, they want fathers and mothers to love them and encourage them and show them how to trust in the Lord. That's what they're really looking for. The statistics are overwhelming. If you... Uh, the U.S. Uh, Census Bureau says 24.7 million children in America, this is two years ago, are living without their biological fathers at home. One out of three children are coming home to a fatherless house. One out of three. So you're looking at the scripture, you're like, wait a minute, Asaph, like, like, the father didn't tell me anything. And a lot of kids, like, when they hear the word father, man, oh, that word is associated with pain. So this is the cool thing about the scripture, and it just really came out to me, and I never saw it before, but Asaph says, so the problem is, who's telling them? Who's telling the next generation? So Asaph says something very powerful and very prophetic, and I believe it's a word for you today, verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, we will tell the next generation. And this is what hit me. He uses the phrase, we will. Everybody say that back to me. We will. He said, primary responsibility of the fathers, but Asaph says, hold on a second, hold on a second. We will, what's he talking about? He's talking about the community of believers. He's talking about the church. You hear me? For the kids that don't have dad at home, Asaph's saying, there's something you got to, I want you to remember, community of faith, you call yourself the church, it's your responsibility too, to tell them about the praiseworthy deeds of God. And it hit me. We will. 
What a biblical call and a responsibility that we have. And I, I'm telling you this, there's never been a time in the history of the church where there has been more of a need for spiritual mamas and daddies. There's never been a time in the history of the church there's been more of a need for spiritual mamas and daddies. I'm looking out there right now, Miss Catherine, Miss Barbara, there are so many people in this church that have stepped into my life where I was lacking the proper parents and they have become a spiritual mom and dad. And because of that, I, I have found my place at the table. And my life is a reflection now of that. Um, I remember when we first got saved, um, uh, me and Noah and Brant and Jesse, we went to the ark. And I've told you guys the story. We walked into this church. We didn't really know what church was like. All these crazy people were speaking in tongues and screaming and singing. The first thing I looked over at Noah, I said, I thought we were on drugs. <laughs> and some of those people are here. <laughs> and, and, and we walked in, and I didn't know what was going on. It was so out of the box for me. And the, the evangelist came up, and he preached this message about Jesus. And I felt the Holy Spirit, you know, and he said, if you want to get saved, raise your hand. And I remember uh, we came up and received the Lord, and the Holy Spirit got on us, and my hand was shaking like this. I told Jesse, I said, I don't know what's happened to me, but it's good. And, but I, and the power of God was flowing through my life, and I, just, I, could, I could sense some of the things were getting just, 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 just totally healed. And, and I remember um, in that time, and I'm not knocking the church, but I'm just being honest with my testimony. Um, I came back to church the next week and the next month, and, 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 and there was no one in the church that reached out to, to us and said, hey, guys, hey, guys, I want you to come over to my house. So what happened in this church is we just got saved every single week. And I got saved, and I came back, I did a bunch of, you know, I messed up, and I got saved the next week, and then I messed up, and I got saved again. I got saved like 400 times a year. I'm serious. And Noah, 600 times. He ain't here right now, but you can tell him about that. And I just kept getting saved, and I got saved more and more. And you know what I needed? I needed a father. I needed a mama. I needed someone to tell me. And all of a sudden, a lay person, his name is Billy Diggs. Wasn't a pastor, wasn't a pastor. He saw us and he did something really spiritual. He didn't lecture us, he didn't lecture us, he didn't try to control us. He said, I want you guys to come over for dinner. He brought us over for dinner and he started to feed us. And then he knew we loved basketball. He happened to like basketball too. He played basketball with us almost every day. I mean, we went over there three, four times a week at one time and he wasn't preaching at us. What he was doing was loving us where we are. He was connecting to us. There would be birthdays, you know, and some of us didn't have families that made a big deal about our birthdays. But I remember going over to Billy's house, and there was a cake for me. It had my name on it. And I can tell you that the spiritual mother and fathering of this man has, 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 has been a, 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 a big building block to who I am today. And it, and it took him getting out of his comfort zones and engaging me and walking with me, saying, this is the way, son, walk in it. And my call to you and my call to this church is you have fatherless generations. You have all these generations and they're confused and you lost. And what do you expect? They need the church to rise up and look at them and call them and bring them to the table. And that's what God has for you this morning. So one of the, I, I absolutely love this quote from Andy Stanley. Your greatest contribution to the kingdom of God may not be something you do, but someone you raise. One of the practical steps, if I could take all the things that I've learned in youth ministry, all the books that I've read, one of the things that I think is very practical and helpful for you today is this, this quote. If you want to help the next generation win, don't think control, think connect. Do you all hear me? We need to get out of the mindset of control, and maybe that's how you were taught, okay? We, we, we have the mindset where the older generation, we, we just want to fix them. We, you know, we just want to fix them, you know. We want to lecture them. We have a tendency of control. And, and listen, you know, um, control's a myth, okay. I figured that out after my second child. And, and now I know it. Control's a myth. And, and, and I get it. It gets so disrespectful. The other day at youth group, I'm, there's this kid and he's slapping people during worship and I'm getting so mad. And I, I go over to him and I said, you know, stop talking. You know what he said to me? He goes, why don't you be quiet over there, old man Rivers? 
I thought, control. I pointed at him, and I asked him to come outside, and I honestly was so mad. I wanted to hog tie him. And you know what I wanted to do after I hog tie him? I wanted to baptize him in the pond. And I'm just telling you, it was going to be a slow motion baptism. No, I'm serious. That's what I wanted to do. You called me Old Man Rivers? Let me just squeeze the sin out of you. <laughs> listen, listen, it's funny, but it's true. It's a generation. How did control work for you guys? So many people come from church backgrounds where it was really about law and control, and it was about lecturing, and God's angry at you, and you, you know, don't think control, think connect. You know what I said to the kid? I, can, I, I composed myself. She used to get this out because I was preaching on the message. I looked at him. I'm like, can I take you to lunch? And my head was twitching. And you know what he said? That'd be great, Pastor Jamie. You know, if I did what I wanted to do to that boy, I'd be in jail again. But, but, it, but hey, look, if I responded the way that I wanted to respond, maybe the way that I was taught to respond... You know where he would be? He'd be at a different church, and he might not even ever be back at church. But because I was able to take him out to lunch, I got to hear his story. You know what was crazy about his story is once I heard his story, I understood his behavior. Don't think control. Think connect. There's a generation that they're spending seven and a half hours a day in front of a screen, and they think they're in authentic relationship. They're not in authentic relationship. It's artificial community. I don't care how many likes you have or how many friends you have on the social media. What they really want, church, is they want a family. They want people that are willing to, to get past those things. And I know it can be difficult. And, it, and I, it's hard for me at times to get out of my shell to reach them. But there's a generation and they're crying for a place at the Father's table. And the Lord says, listen, I want you to show them a Father's heart. So I'm getting ready to be done here. Mr. Richard, can you come? Mr. Richard. I love Mr. Richard. <laughs> As Richard plays, um, I just want you to think about this for a minute. I want to pray for you. The word of God says to you that when you reach out to the next generation, verse 7, here's the goal, that they would put their trust in God. That there's a goal, church. There's a goal for reaching that next generation, for passing the torch, that they might put their trust in God. And so I, 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 I want to pray for you right now because I know that as they're lost and confused and they're hurting, and when they walk into church, your eyes is love. You say, Jamie, I, I'm not a preacher like you. I can't preach. I can't sing like Felicia. I can't pray like Mr. Rod. <laughs> you know, I, I don't have all these giftings. You know, the most spiritual thing someone did for me is invite me. Do they frustrate you? I know they frustrate me. I know I probably frustrate some of you. But they're his generation. And that's the way it's going to happen, guys. When we see the evil that's encroaching on us, when we see what's going on right now, and the enemy would like to say that we're losing, the enemy would like to say that we're not going to win this thing. You know how we're going to win? Because this generation is going to rise up and be the thing that God's called them to be. And you know who's going to help them? We're going to help them. So in Jesus' name, I'm praying for you right now. That right now where you're at, that the Lord will be putting upon your heart ways that you can be all in. That there might be people right now that the Lord is putting in your, my, putting in your spirit that maybe are far off. And you know what? You're annoyed with them. And their behavior frustrates the junk out of you. But today that you might have a fresh perspective. That you might have fresh eyes. I mean, you got to realize that the reason why they're acting like that, there's a reason why they're acting like that, because it comes from hurt and not belonging. And so what would happen to liberty if everyone operated with, 
with the idea, the responsibility that we're passing the, cho- the torch, I'm telling you guys, we're going to see it in our time. And it's going to be beautiful. And so in Jesus' name, I pray that God would bless you and the Holy Spirit would sweep through your heart with conviction and strength to do the thing that God's called you to do, that your life would be on mission with shouting the praises of God to the next generation. I am so proud of you guys as a church. And as I look around into the youth ministry, into the children's ministry, um, I see a church that's investing in these kids. And I see a church that's winning. So we're going to be up here for prayer. um, And I just want you guys to know that um, I'm grateful for you and I believe that God's word is going to go out and accomplish his purposes today and so we thank you for being here we thank you for being family but just like you were pulled in now it's your chance to pull someone else in you see these empty seats they have names on them and some of those names might be kids I had families like to beach them even old Dave over there loved me in a time God can do anything, can he, Dave? (laughs) So I just want you guys, I want to release you, and I want you to know I love you guys, and you are my family, and there's a family, and they're calling for you. Step in. Be a mentor. Do the thing that God's called you to do. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you guys.